I'd like to welcome you guys to the Kernstown Battlefield. Uh, as Steve said, I'm Mike Canan. I have a bachelor's degree in history and have studied Nathan, been studying Nathan Kimmel for about two years. Uh, found that there are actually no biographies about this guy, which honestly surprises me. So with that, I will start out with a question. Who is the only Union officer to defeat both Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson in separate battles? Nathan Kimball. Nathan Kimball. <laughs> All right. So there are two commanders of brigades that are named for their fighting qualities in the Army of the Potomac. One of them is the Iron Brigade. The other one is commanded by Nathan Kimball. It's, it's the Gibraltar Brigade, in case you're wondering. <clears throat> this is one, one uh, as I tell the story of Nathan Kimball, what somebody has described as the Forrest Gump of the Civil War. No, he, he's, he's one of those people that just kind of shows up, and you're not really sure why he's there. He just, there he is. Well, it starts out very simply, as we all do, okay? He's born November 22nd, 1822, in a small little town. In fact, it's probably a wide spot in the road. It's Fredericksburg, Indiana. It's about 10 miles across the Ohio River, but due west or so, of Louisville, Kentucky. He's born to, and this has been the, the challenge for me as a researcher, he's born to a long line of Nathan Kimballs. The family's been in, the, in the, the country, or in the new world, I guess I should say, since the mid-1640s, and they find, you find a lot of Nathan or Nathaniels. His father is Nathaniel Kimball, his grandfather is Nathan Kimball, so they have a tendency to run into, into that. In fact, as it keeps going down, down the line, into the 20th century, there are Nathan Kimballs from this route. So they, they have a tendency to really like this, this name, but not much is known about this guy's early life, all right? He's there in Fredericksburg. He does go to school. We do know that. He, the first time he really shows up in an historical context is in 1839, he will join what will become DePaul University. So he's a 17-year-old kid going to university now. And he'll be there for two years. Then he ends up, th there are a couple things that you'll find out about Nathan Kimball, especially as we go through the lecture, is that number one, he likes helping people. That's really what he does. Number two is he's extremely uh, ambitious. All right, he wants to make something of himself. He wants to be a member of the community, by, be an active member of the community. And you'll find definitely about that. The other thing that you'll find out is, is that he's also rather, mm, self-aggrandizing, but he doesn't know how to do it. He's not very good at, at, at his self-promotion, but he likes to do that. He'll leave, the, he'll leave DePaul University, he'll go out to, Indian, uh, to Independence, Missouri, and he'll be a school teacher there for just a few months. He'll try studying law. Again, he's trying different things. He doesn't know quite what he wants to do. Then he, make, he gets a, a, a kind of a, a great, great idea. He decides that instead of being a teacher or a lawyer, he's gonna go be a doctor. So he goes, in 1844, he goes to what will become the University of Louisville Medical School, all right? And he studies under Dr. Alexander McFeeters. Dr. McFeeters is his, will soon be his brother-in-law, and they will remain friends the rest of their lives. So not only is he his physician mentor, but he also eventually is his brother-in-law. In 1845, he marries his first wife, a lady by the name of Martha Ann McFeeters, with whom he has one child, uh, who does survive to adulthood, which is fine. He has a total of eight children, only four of whom survive. <clears throat> Excuse me, pardon me. Anyway, however, in 1846, the country starts falling apart. And it's not the country, and now it's at war. American blood has been spilled on American soil. So says President Polk. So being the good patriotic citizen that he does, he has a choice. He's a, not, he's a freshly minted physician. He could go and be a surgeon in a, in a war unit to go down to fight the Mexicans. So he decides he's highly ambitious. Remember, he's not interested in being a surgeon. He's interested in being a fighting man. So he joins what is known as the Posey Guards, which is the second Indiana Volunteer Infantry Company G. And he's their captain. Second Indiana is notable for a few things in Mexican War. Well, first thing, with the subject of our talk is a member of the Mexican War, Nathan Kimball. But there are three other members of the Mexican of the Mexican War, Second Indiana, that are known to history. 
First, it will be a future uh, Civil War general, a fellow by the name of Lovell Rousseau. He'll be a division commander in the uh, Army of the Ohio and then the Army of the Cumberland in the, in the Civil War. Number two is a fellow by the name of Joseph Lane. Now, you may remember the 1860 presidential election, and Joseph Lane is the running mate of John C. Breckinridge. Here's this guy from Indiana running alongside the Southern Democrat for president. It's interesting. The, th the last guy, we will run into him several times in this talk, is a fellow by the name of William Bowles. And William Bowles and Nathan Kimball are politically opposites. Nathan Kimball is a very staunch Whig, later, later will be a Republican. William Bowles is a staunch Democrat. So politically, they're opposites. Personally, they are, they are not opposites until the Battle of Buena Vista. In February of 1847, you have the Battle of Buena Vista. Now, it depends on who, on who you believe and which story you read. But the story basically goes is that the second Indiana is on the right of the, of the, the United States line, John or General Taylor, and they are being attacked by approximately 7,000 Mexican soldiers. And in the course of this battle, the second Indiana, again, it depends on who you read. If you read Nathan Kimball, he keeps about 120 men on the field. If you read William Bowles, the entire second Indiana runs away, and then some of them come back later. But the, the end result is, is that Nathan Kimball ends up back on the field with approximately 120 men from the, from the second, Indi or second Indiana, fighting approximately 7,000 Mexican soldiers. Now, the regiment next to him happens to be commanded by, it happens to be the Mississippi Rifles, commanded by a fellow by the name of Jefferson Davis. Now, yes, it is that Jefferson Davis, okay? So it is the, the future president of the Confederate States of America. This time he's a colonel in the Mexican War, and Kimball goes up to uh, Colonel Davis and says, Colonel, my, my regiment, 2nd Indiana, has, has routed off the field, but my boys are still here. Where would you like us? And Davis says, just maintain your position on the, on the flank and guard my flank. And he says, yes, sir, I can do that. Well, now, all of a sudden, the crisis has come for William Bowles and Nathan Kimball because they are interested in different things. Kimball, Kimball accuses William Bowles of being a coward. And later that year, shortly thereafter, actually, the Battle of Buena Vista, when Bowles is leading the regiment, they're on parade, and Nathan Kimball will turn around and turn his back on him which of course is a no-no for any of you who have been in the military. So Bowles accuses um, Kimball of disobedience of orders, has him arrested, has him arraigned on court-martial charges. The court-martial never takes place, however. Why? Because they're mustered out in April of 1847, and that was when they should have been court-martialed, but because the, they were eligible to be mustered out, they just said, you know what, let's just blow this over and get it out of here. So he goes back to Indiana, but now he has an enemy. We will run into William Bowles again. All right, this is not the only time that Kimball interacts with Bowles in the course of his life. Well, he comes home, and he's, he, he enters into a practice, okay? Disaster strikes the, the Kimball household in 1850. In uh, April of 1850, his wife, Martha Ann, she dies. I have not been able to find out how she dies, so... I'm sorry for, for that one, but I haven't been able to find out her cause of death. However, in July, he decides that he's a 28-year-old single father of one, and he needs to find another wife. So he ends up marrying her cousin, Mar Emily Clarinda. So between April and July, he finds that he likes Emily Clarinda, and they, of course, will get married, and they will have seven more children, four of which will, or three of which, rather, will survive to adulthood. He will enter into practice in a small old town. If, if, if Fredericksburg is a wide spot in the road, so is Livonia. Livonia, in fact, if you look it up on Google, Google Earth, Livonia, there's like a church and a store, a couple houses, and then you move out of the town. There's nothing else there, all right? Regardless of that, he has a successful life. Nothing really is going on until April 1860, okay? In 1860, Sorry, 61, my bad. Of course, we are having the Civil War. So the Civil War comes around, and Nathan Kimball again has the same choice that he had from the Mexican War. He has, so he's a doctor, he's a much more prominent physician, he's a much more prominent member of the community now, he's a Mexican War veteran, he has ran unsuccessfully for elector to president 
for the Electoral College, because of course the Electoral College at the time was not a rubber stamp like it is today. All right, you actually had to choose your electors at the time, and he ran unsuccessfully for that. So he's becoming well known in the community. He's interested in taking care of his boys, but he's interested in fighting the Confederates. So he makes the same choice in 1861 that he made in 1846. And he decides instead of being the captain of the Posey Guards, he's going to be the colonel of the 14th Indiana. So he is elected as the colonel of the 14th Indiana. Just the AC, no problem. All right. And he will be assigned to George Britt McClellan's Western Virginia campaign. And he will be assigned in a, uh, he'll be across the uh, Stanton Turnpike, which is modern day US 250, runs through the mountains just west of Stanton, it's the Stanton Turnpike. And he'll be assigned to guard a section through the center of the state, or what will become the state of West Virginia. At a place called Cheat Mountain, they built a fort. Well, his opponent happens to be future Robert E. Lee, you know, the great general of the South, arguably. Some people would classify him as the greatest general in the South. But at this point in time, he's just Robert Lee, the commander of the Virginia State Forces, and he's launching this, this probe, if you will, into central West Virginia. And Nathan Kimball, standing there on top of his mountain, and it is quite a mountain, you stand up there and you look down. So he's standing there on top of this mountain and he looks down and he sees Lee's forces kind of dithering. They're not really, they're not sure what's going on. They're, they're kind of waiting there. They're just, there's not much going on. So Kimball says, okay, well, if you're not gonna play with me, I'm gonna come play with you. So he charges down the mountain and drives them off. It's 300, 300 Union soldiers. 